Ryan Marshang is a junior at the University of Pennsylvania, pursuing dual degrees in economics and chemical engineering. Last year, Ryan and some of his classmates launched Invisergy, a developer of solar technology building materials. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So dual degrees in economics and chemical engineering, that sounds pretty ambitious. How did you start down that path? Why did you decide to, to take both? Definitely. Um, so I think in high school, one of the difficulties I had was I was interested in a lot of different things. Um, and two of my major passions were energy and finance. So I got really lucky in trying to, in finding the, the management and technology program here at Penn, which is the dual degree program, which effectively allows you to study two things in four years and get two degrees. Um, so while it is ambitious, I think the two concepts of business and technology go really well together. Um, and it fell right in line with what I was passionate about. So it was a natural fit for what I wanted to do. Does it ever get overwhelming, two degrees in four years? Yeah, it does. I would say it's nice in some respects, though, when you could bounce around from different things that allows you to do more. For example, if I were you know, taking a lot of classes and just studying finance day after day, I think I might get a little bit sick of it. But it's nice being able to bounce back from a fluid mechanics course in engineering and then when I'm sick of working on a problem set there, going into to finance or management and studying something else. So because there's so many different concepts flying around, um, it's easy to do a lot of it, I guess, if that makes sense. Mm. So what kind of career path might you pursue with both of those specialties? Absolutely. Um, so I think there's a lot of things you can accomplish just with, for example, say you just have a business degree from Wharton. It's a very general degree. And there's a lot of things you can do in terms of consulting, finance, business development, things like that. Um, but when you add in a technical component, for example, with me, chemical engineering, what I see myself doing is really leveraging my technical expertise on that side and using my business, um, my business knowledge and things such as that to actually drive technology forward. So I think the M&T program, the program I'm in, was founded on this idea that there's usually a disconnect in some respect between engineers and business development and business, the business side of the equation where the technical guys are very involved in the details of a problem and the business developers are looking at how to drive something forward and the communication gap isn't always filled. So I see myself kind of filling that gap in an entrepreneurial setting or even in a company where you have a technology and you want to commercialize that technology. So you need to understand the technical components of it, but understand how to actually commercialize it. So I see myself bridging that gap in some field. Interesting. So when did you decide to launch Invisergy? Um, and what was your business model? Tell us about the business. Absolutely. Um, so first off, I'll just talk a bit about Invisergy. So Invisergy is a solar technology company focusing on green or clean building materials. Um, and the company was actually founded with three dual degree Penn students in the M&T program. So I was very involved in entrepreneurialism as a freshman at Penn, working on a couple of ventures, nothing too serious, um, but really just getting myself into that community of entrepreneurs, which is very strong at Penn. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I was very passionate about energy. Mm. So I actually fell into um, meeting Rashab Jain, which was our CEO, who's a, an alumni of the M&T program. He reached out to Penn um, to look to build a team. And so Rashab was, he's now pursuing his PhD at MIT. And he had been working on the technical side of a technology called luminescent solar concentrators, which was a technology developed in the 1970s. But he wrote his master's thesis on this, was doing some research up at MIT, and thought, hey, there might be some potential here. So he was actually looking to reach out to Penn knowing that there's m and students who understand the business side of things and also the technical side of the equation. Um, started talking with him about the technology, then came upon the idea of, you know, maybe we want to form a company and actually do something with this. So really, it started out as a, a technology up there. Then we connected with some alumni from the m and program, which is a very strong network. Um, and from there, we just drove the business. Mm. So what is the business? Help me understand yeah. it. So what we do, so I mentioned luminescent solar concentrators, but basically it's a novel way to trap solar energy. Um, and so what you can do with our technology is basically you can kind of envision it as a transparent solar window. But what we do is we use a transparent surface like glass or even mylar or something like that where the light hits that surface and we redirect it 
to capture that energy. So the problem we're, we're trying to engage is that in the United States, buildings in general consume 70% of the electricity, which you know may seem shocking or not, but they're basically energy hogs. And so if you can reduce their energy consumption, that goes a long way into improving you know, energy efficiency for the United States, for the world. And so our goal was to drop energy or increase energy efficiency for buildings. So one of the major problems with solar is that when you deploy these large solar farms and things and such, it takes up a lot of land. So either you could generate energy offsite and then transmit that to, to buildings so that they can use clean energy. Alternatively, and what we were thinking much more radically was, there's a lot of surface area on buildings, on skyscrapers. Why not just try and generate energy on site? And so that's where you see the idea of rooftop solar panels and things such as that. But even more radically, we were thinking, look at all the windows on these buildings. Why don't we make these windows smarter? Why don't we generate electricity from the windows themselves? And you encounter the problem of you have a transparent window and you're trying to capture energy that goes through that. And that's where our technology comes in is that we thought we had a way, and we did to some extent, to efficiently capture that energy to maintain the transparency of that window and then also generate electricity there on site for buildings. So <clears throat> what is your role in the business? Absolutely. Um, so what I was focused on mainly was business development. And kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier, my major role was, one, understanding the technology, which our CEO and our CTO were working very hard on, and then looking at how to commercialize that. So we had a very strong, I guess, scientific foundational technology, and we were trying to decide how to integrate that into a window. So talking to customers, trying to understand what the market wants, trying to find a product market fit for our technology. So, you know, one of the difficult things in starting a business in the building space, for example, is that you need to understand who's the decision maker in that process. You know, once we build our window, who do we have to sell to? What's our sales cycle like? How are we gonna market this? So really just trying to push our product into market in an effective way was what I was focused on. So that meant a lot of meetings with people and... Absolutely, yeah, meeting with customers, architects, designers, things such as that. Did you learn a lot through that process? Absolutely, because I didn't know anything about buildings um, going into this. I knew a lot about, I guess, the technical side of the equation, but there's so much more um, to running a business, especially in that vertical. So it's a great learning experience. Yeah. yeah. And is there any other kind of technology like this? I mean, it sounds very new and, mm -hmm. and, you know, are you on a new frontier or are there others already doing it? So there's definitely, I would say, competitors in the space, but mm -hmm. it's so new um, that I think everyone kind of works together. So the market, I guess, we were entering was called building integrated photovoltaics. So I would say BIPV is what it's called, is on the frontier of solar. So it's finding new um, ways to implement solar into buildings and things like that. So also like roof tiles, just being smarter about how we deploy existing technologies. So similar to what we were working on, we were focusing on this transparency aspect of, can you kind of make a transparent solar solution? And so we weren't creating transparent solar cells, but there are people doing that. Um, there's also people working on flexible solar cells. So I would say kind of that area of solar is on the frontier of the general industry, and, and we were definitely there. And we found out the hard way that that can be very difficult um, to, to have people accept that and, and I guess take on a little bit of risk to try something radical and new. Yeah, okay, so I wanna talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So all of this was going on last year, correct? Yeah. You yeah. were doing a lot of business development. Mm -hmm. And how much progress was made with Invisergy, but also where does it stand right now? Absolutely, so we spent a bit over a year to date um, on the project and I would say we, kind of spun our wheels a little bit starting out. Um, the four founders of the company, this was our first real shot at, at driving a company forward, incorporating, you know, really spending a lot of money and putting a lot of effort into it. So we made, it was slow starting really because we had to acquire mentors, figure out what direction we wanted to take the company and the vision wasn't entirely clear. So the first four to five months was really just getting a business plan together, talking to people at Wharton in the Venture Initiation Program, um, entering a lot of business plan competitions and trying to find that, that vision and understanding of what we wanted to actually do, which is really important. 
Um, then heading into last summer, actually, we started to to push a bit more. Um, we had, I guess, raised not raised, but one, you know, ten, a couple ten, tens of thousands of dollars to to develop a prototype and things like that. And so what we did is we got into an incubator slash accelerator called Mass Challenge up in Boston, which is where our lab was located. And then I spent the summer out in San Francisco. Can you explain a little bit about what an incubator does? Yeah, sure. So there's incubators and accelerators, and it's kind of a new concept that's come up over the past you know, five years or so. But it's really, there's a lot of incubators now. And what it is, and it varies depending on what vertical, there's energy, uh, you know, healthcare incubators, but it basically incubates your business. So they provide you one with capital. So some incubators might have you apply, and if you get in, you get, say, $10,000 for a couple months um, to support yourself, things like that. So capital, but also resources in, the terms of, in terms of mentors, in terms of being around entrepreneurs who can help you solve similar problems. Um, and also, the idea sometimes is to connect you with potential investors. So kind of providing you all those nutrients that you need um, to, to grow and launch your business, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we were in the Mass Challenge um, Incubator, which is actually the largest um, accelerator, I guess you would call it, in the United States right now, which is cool. Um, and then I spent some time out in San Francisco starting to talk to angels and starting to talk to people who had been in the space. And that's when we really, really started to learn um, about the industry in general. So meeting with Kevin Suris of Serious Materials, which is a great company in the space, and just learning Basically, instead of making the mistakes ourselves, learning what they had learned through their mistakes, um, which was really enlightening in terms of our business. So we learned that, you know, one, renewables are having a, a difficult time, per se, right now in general. Um, but in the building space in particular, it was difficult. And we had a lot of wrong assumptions. And so we started to find this out about six months in, in June or July. And some of these assumptions are, for example, when you're talking about buildings, we had a very radical technology. We were talking about producing energy from you know, your windows. Um, but building owners are very conservative and not necessarily willing to make an investment in a radical technology like that. And it makes sense, because if you think about it, buildings are erected for, and built for, you know, they might stand for 50 or 100 years. So then you start thinking about, do I want to put a technology like this, which might become obsolete, um, might not work, increases risk. Once I put that building up, how am I going to take that technology down and things like that? And so those are things we hadn't necessarily thought of, but were really important. And so what we found is that, yes, building owners are willing to increase or trying to increase the efficiency of their buildings because it makes sense. They, it costs a lot to, to heat them, to cool them. Um, but they're looking to do it on a different, through different technologies. And so some of those technologies are energy software, um, I guess startups, for example, that help you track what appliances are using that energy. And so it's very capitally efficient necessarily to implement those technologies. And they had a shorter payback period. So our payback period was on the order of five years. And some of these efficiency companies, um, software efficiency companies, were, you know, could pay back in under a year. And so what we found is the adoption for those technologies would probably happen before ours. Um, so with those realizations and a lot more, we actually, in December, decided to dissolve the corporation just because, you know, I guess we were a bit naive in thinking that we could move forward a lot quicker than we could. And I don't think the technology, I think the technology still has potential for sure, but it would definitely be a five to 10 year commitment um, to make this really succeed. And that's a tough choice to make when you're in school um, right now. So. So how does that feel when you invest so much time into something and so much energy? Yeah. How does it feel when you just have to give it up? It's tough. Um, and I think we probably could have made the decision earlier. And I think that's why it took so long for us to, to make that decision is because we didn't really want to give it up. Um, but it's nice. I think it's much more easier to make that decision when you're in school and when you have a lot to fall back on. For example, I mean, you're still studying. You still could get a job out of school. You could still start another company. Um, it's nice in that sense. I think the, the decision gets a whole lot tougher um, when you're working on this full time. 
and you don't have that to fall back on, which is one of the reasons I think you should definitely start a company when you're in school. It's the safest time you will ever have to really run a company because, you know, if you fail, nothing's gone wrong and you could learn a lot through your mistakes. And so failing is actually probably a good thing. So it was tough um, to make that decision, but I think there's a lot of cool things still to do. Um, so I'm excited about working on new projects, new businesses. Before we talk about that, mm -hmm. energy is a passion of yours. Yeah. We hear so much about the energy economy, the green economy. Mm -hmm. um, is it really holding promise for jobs and economic development in the future? What's your, what's your take on the energy economy? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of progress over the past decade in terms of energy. And I think, so I come from an oil family, actually. My dad's a petroleum engineer. So I've been around that <laughs> conventional side of energy my whole life. Um, and now I'm very passionate about renewables. So I think there's a lot of promise there. But the problem with a lot of renewable technologies is, you know, energy density in terms of in comparison to coal and oil and the infrastructure is not necessarily in place. Um, so I think what we're, we're talking about solar and wind solar, technology. wind, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and costs are very high. So what I think we'll see probably over the next 50 years or so is all of the energy, different alternative energies working together. And I think that's what's really needed. There's a lot of work being done right now in terms of updating our grid. And so one of the things when you talk about like solar and wind is distributed energy. So now instead of the old model where you, at an at a energy generation or a power generation plant, you would generate all your electricity, then distribute, distribute it. Now you might be able to generate your own electricity at your house through solar. And the grid isn't really set up to handle generation from all those different points. So the grid's being updated, and once the grid is updated, now we can start deploying more solar. And everything basically through smart grid technology can start to work together, and I think that's what we'll see. Um, all, obviously, as well with the shale, the shale boom over the past five years, t past decade, really changed the landscape a lot with the decreased prices in natural gas, basically made renewables not as competitive anymore because there was cheap alternative energy or cheap energy from natural gas. So I think natural gas is going to play a huge part as well um, in the energy economy moving forward. I think things look well, um, but there's just a lot of, a lot of stuff happening, and it's tough to say. Mm. So you said you were excited about the future. Um, do you think you'll resurrect Invisergy at some point, or where do you see yourself going? What, what's happening next for you? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely a possibility. I think I'm very interested in energy, and to be an entrepreneur in the energy space, in terms of technological development, I think I might need to go pursue a PhD. So I'm looking at MIT um, or Stanford to pursue a PhD in chemical engineering. And when I'm there, hopefully working on some technology with the hope of commercializing it. Um, also, I think what we've seen is that just the time frame for developing energy technologies is much longer than the typical like tech startup scene. And that's one of the things I was a bit naive, naive, naive of heading into this whole startup um, in Visergy is that when people think like, oh, startups, entrepreneurialism, a lot of people I think are drawn to tech crunch, a lot of you know, Y Combinator, like coding and things like that. And the thing I found out is, you know, the landscape of entrepreneur or, or of startups is very different. And so in energy, like a capital intensive startup versus just launching a website, I would say are far more different than comparing this website to, you know, a Fortune 500 company or something such as Apple. Like they're very, very different. And so it's a tough decision for me to make what type of, of startup I want to work on. But because I like energy, and I think energy is more suited towards that capital intensive side of the equation, I think I need to go develop my technical skills a little bit more. So that's kind of my plan now, but uh, we'll see. Okay, well, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.